Hi kids, um, I'm back. This is Miss Witt, and I'm going to read you a chapter from the Titanic Young Survivors from Alan Zulu, Zulo, sorry. And it um, is from a second class passenger. This young girl, Eva Hart, she is traveling with her parents and she experiences this tragedy and it lives with her for the rest of her life. But um, if you remember, when we talked about second class passengers, there were 42% of the children that were in second class survived. Eva was one of those. So there were 34 children traveling in second class and there were 30 that survived. So that means four of those children perished. And if you remember correctly too, the Titanic happened in 1912 in April, and there were not enough lifeboats for everyone to survive. And that was um, a very tragic thing to occur. Um, part of it was that there was no laws at that time, and another part was that the Titanic was assumed to be unsinkable. It had so much technology and so much of the coming age, things that prevented it from having such a tragedy that you had to have um, a domino of effects. So many things had to mishap in order for this to happen. So um, it was, a, you know, after the Titanic, many laws were developed in order to um, have more safety procedures. But at this time, they were not in place. Um, they didn't have drills. And so there was a, everybody was kind of running amok and they, um, the protocol for women and children first, it really led to a lot of deaths. One side of the Titanic, the, office, the men that were loading the lifeboats stuck to just women and children, and they released so many lifeboats that were not full because they thought that it was only women and children. And in the other side, on the other side, they were, once they filled boats with women and children, then they were letting the men that were nearby come in. And the, the uh, frigid water that the people, many of the people that ended up in the water did not drown, they died from hypothermia from the, the 28 degree water. But you know, if you'll just follow along, we will hear about Eva Hart and her family. And this chapter is called, When Will the Screaming Stop? You stop and think of it, that's really a sad event to think about, that when does the screaming stop? It stops when all the people are gone. Can you imagine being on the Titanic and the chaos and the screaming and the terror in, this mid in the middle of the night occurrence where they hit the iceberg and the women and children being separated from the men and their family. It was, just, it was just a very tragic event. So, Eva Hart. The unearthly cries for help from those doomed to die reverberated in the frigid blackness, petrifying seven-year-old Eva Hart. In her packed lifeboat, the little girl screamed, trying to drown out the persistent moans and wails of hundreds upon hundreds of people who had jumped or been pitched off the sinking Titanic moments earlier. The chilling drone of those unfortunate souls who were left bobbing in the deadly waters terrorized Eva to her core. No matter how loud she screeched or how hard she covered her ears, she could still hear the awful sounds of human misery. She thought, when will the screaming stop? But with every unbearable minute that passed, the wretched noise slackened as one by one, the freezing water stole the life faded passengers. Exhausted, Eva stopped crying, and then she heard something that left her feeling even more cold. Silence. Dead silence. To the shell-shocked girl, it was as if the whole world was standing still, paralyzed by the enormity of this unbelievable disaster. Think about the word enormity. It come, it's related to the word enormous. So it's a huge tragedy bigger than anyone would have ever been thinking. 
In the vast nothingness, even the stars, brighter than she had ever had imagined, seemed to stop sparks. Overwhelmed by the creepy quiet and stillness, she started screaming again. Her mother, Esther, gave her a comforting hug. Although what Eva wanted even more was, was feeling the strong arms of her father, Benjamin, and hearing his reassuring voice. But he wasn't there. He was somewhere out there in the dark, dying. Remember the protocol of women, protocol of women and children first. Just months earlier, Eva didn't have a care in the world, enjoying the love and warmth of her parents in Ilford, a village outside London, where Ben, 47, was a skilled carpenter and builder. That makes sense for him to be on second class, because that's where you, you it cost a little more, but it was um, where the, the people that had a, uh, a, a career that they had, the skilled workers, they could go and find jobs, and they may, might be moving to America with their family. Esther was 41 when she had Eva, their only child. The parents adored the willowy, raven-haired daughter, and she adored them. During the Christmas holiday, a friend of her father's who had moved to Winnipeg, Canada, returned to Ilford for a visit. One evening, he had dinner at the Hart's home, where he talked about the prosperous life he had created in Winnipeg and encouraged Ben who was having difficulty finding work to join him. The next day, Ben announced that the family would move to Winnipeg to take advantage of the new opportunities that awaited them there. It's kind of interesting that it says that he announces that, didn't have the discussion with his wife. They just kind of made that decision that they were going to get up and move. What about the risks? Esther asked. Ah, oh, I'll either sink or swim, he replied. It was an expression he used whenever he tried anything new. It's pretty ironic that the expression that he used was, I will either sink or swim, because basically that's what happened. Sitting Eva on his lap and calling her by her pet name, he said, baby, how would you like to live in a new country? We'll take a big boat across the ocean and then a train to a beautiful place where the sun shines almost every day and the trees remain green year round lakes of sky blue. Oh, Daddy, that sounds like fun. As happy as her father was, Eva sensed her mother wasn't pleased by the move. For Esther, it meant leaving her friends and her elderly parents, and she worried that she would never see them again. That would happen a lot. You would move in 1912. You would move across the ocean. It was an expensive trip for most people, so if you made that voyage, you might not ever have the opportunity to go back and know the people that you love you might never ever see again. The hearts were booked on the ship Philadelphia to New York where they planned to spend time with a relative of Ben's before taking a train across Canada to Winnipeg. But there was an unexpected change in their travel plans. Because of a strike by coal miners in the United Kingdom there wasn't enough coal to fuel the Philadelphia. As a result the hearts were given the opportunity to sell on the Titanic whose owners had purchased enough coal from the crossing. So in 1912, there was this big coal strike so that not all the ships could get the supplies that they needed. And the Titanic, it was going to be its very first voyage, and they had spared no expense. It had all these new fancy things, but the coal, they had bought it all up. So these people, just imagine how excited they were that they were going to get to go on this historic voyage, the very first ship of this enormous ship, ship called the Titanic that everybody was raving about, the electricity, the elevators, the food, all of the things, and they were going to get to go for a fraction of the cost. So these people were pretty excited. Isn't this wonderful, Ben told Eva and Esther. We're going on the maiden voyage of the greatest ship ever built. Eva was thrilled because her father was so excited, but she saw that her mother was aghast. Isn't that the ship they say is unsinkable? Esther asked. No, he replied, grinning. That's the ship that is unsinkable. But Ben, that's flying in the face of God, she declared. I'm so frightened. Oh, don't be silly, Esther. We're fortunate to go on such a great vessel. Eva could tell her mother wasn't convinced. I dread the sea, 
Eva said. The idea of being on the Esther said, sorry. The idea of being on the sea at night is bad enough for one night, but for six or seven, it will be a nightmare over and over for me. Nonsense, said Ben. You'll love it. Eva was off by the vessel. The hearts had a cozy four-berth cabin in second class. Remember, if it was a four-berth cabin, birth doesn't mean like your birthday, the day you were born, B-E-R-T-H. It means your bedding, your bed, the place to sleep. Ben slept on the top berth of one bunk bed, while Eva slept below with her doll and teddy bear. Esther took the lower berth on the other bunk. As Eva was settled in, she said, Well, I've made up my mind about one thing. What's that, Mommy? Eva asked. Until we are safe in New York, I'm not going to sleep at night on this ship. The crew will be less vigilant at night than during the day. So I'm going to be dressed and remain sitting up in bed throughout the night, fully prepared. Fully prepared for what? Ben asked. For the worst, whatever it might be. Eva seldom saw her parents argue, but in the cabin they quarreled over Esther's seemingly irrational fear. Their spat became so heated that for the first time in her life, Eva saw a reason for her anger. Nothing Ben said could persuade Esther to put aside her worries. True to her word, Esther stayed awake each night, lying in her bunk bed, fully dressed. In the morning, she would join her family for breakfast and then sleep until 6 p.m. when she would join them for dinner. Her mother's strange behavior didn't bother Eva. In fact, it was fine with her. It meant she had more one-on-one -on -one time with her father. With her long curly tresses dancing on the breeze, she would race her dad back and forth from the promenade deck, play hide and seek and shop. Ben always gave in to her urge to buy his precious daughter toys and trinkets that were sold strangely on the ship's barber shop. Cruise ships of the day, they have a couple of shops, and you know, they have more than one usually on, on there. But and you know, this was new, but it had it's, you could shop in the barber shop of all places. Eva also enjoyed playing with a new friend she had made. Six-year-old Anna Nina Harbour of London. Nina was traveling with her widowed father and her, the Reverend John Harper, a Baptist minister, and her aunt, Jessie Letch, to Chicago where Harper was slated to conduct several tent revival meetings. Eva and Nina played. Eva's teddy bear and held pretend toothpicks. Sounds like a six and seven year old. It's a good time for them. They explored the ship, taking different passageways until they were stopped by ropes that said, no second class passengers beyond this point. So who got to go beyond that point? The first class passengers. The day wasn't complete without frolicking with a friendly champion French bulldog named Gamian de Pycombe owned by first-class passenger Robert Daniel. So there were dogs on the ship. I hadn't thought about that, but there were, I, I can't remember, but there were like 14 dogs that were on the ship. After breakfast, Eva hurried to the ship's kennel where she was allowed to walk the pooch. She wanted at least 10 dogs on board. Most of the pets, though, were not kept in the kennels, but they stayed in the cabins with their owners. First class, right? See how much Eva loved the bulldog, Ben promised her. Once we get to Winnipeg, I'll get you a dog of your own. Eva threw her arms around his neck and squealed, Oh, thank you, Daddy. By Saturday, Captain Edward Smith chatted with some of the second-class passengers, including Ben and Eva. His ruddy, round face and happy, quiet figure reminded Eva of her own father. During the conversation, Eva told him, Mommy is afraid something bad will happen on the ship. Smith leaned down, patted Eva on the head, and said, There's nothing to worry about, because the Titanic is a wonderfully safe ship. Even God or himself cannot sink her. That evening at dinner, Eva's mother admitted that although she was still troubled, she was feeling less anxious. I'm about as content as I can be at sea, she said. 
night while even Ben were at sleep. Esther, who remained dressed and alert in the lower bunk, said no more. Esther shook Ben and cried out, Ben, Ben, wake up! Something dreadful is happening! Hearing a fog from his brain, Ben sat up. Huh? What's wrong? I was resting, listening to the hum of the propellers, when I had the sensation that some gigantic force had given the ship a mighty push from behind. Not once, not twice, but three times. I was literally frozen in terror. I'm so frightened. Ben groaned and flopped back on his pillow. You're acting crazy, old girl. Your imagination is out of control. I am going back to sleep. No, no, you must listen to me, she said, her voice breaking. Ben, this is real. Please, you must see if we're in danger. No, I'm getting scared, said sleepy-eyed Eva. Oh, I'm so sorry, baby, said Esther, placing her trembling hand on Eva's shoulder. Mommy needs Daddy to make sure everything is fine. You and your unfounded fears, muttered Ben as he threw on a jacket over his pajamas. I'll be back in a minute. Moments later, he returned. Everything is dandy. The sea is calm. The ship is traveling smoothly. And a crewman told me we're right on schedule. So you see, there is nothing to fuss about. Now please, Esther, let us go back to sleep. Whisper was like a command, Esther said. What I felt was real. It's a warning of something bad. Ben, I just know it. It just hasn't happened yet. It's going to happen. Nothing strange. They talked about people having premonitions once more. So it seems like Esther is having a premonition. The next morning, at breakfast, Ben laughingly told the family and din dining companions about Esther's bizarre episode. I figured out what to do to keep her quiet tonight, he said with a chuckle. I'm going to insist she drink a strong glass of hot grog to make her sleep so she can't disrupt Eva and my beauty rest. Because it was Sunday, Esther joined Eva and Ben's church services in the lounge and then ate lunch. They think for the first time that evening, Eva and her father were sleeping. Ben, get up at once. We have hit something. I'm sure of it. And it's serious. Oh, woman, not again. Ben growled. I'm at my wit's end. I don't know what to do with you. Ben, this is real and it's happening right now. I just heard the most awful sound I have ever heard in my life. A dreadful tearing and ripping sound. It was the sound of great masses of steel being violently torn. Mommy, What's wrong? murmured Eva, opening her eyes. Baby, Daddy needs to find out something. Glaring at Ben, Esther said, I insist you investigate right now. None too pleased, Ben grumbled under his breath as he threw on his coat over his pajamas and stormed out of the cabin in his bare feet. Seems like it's really cold outside, so he didn't expect to be gone very long. Come, baby, let's get you dressed, Esther said to Eva. No, Mommy, I want to go back to sleep. Eva rolled over and covered her head with a blanket. You can imagine that. They've already had a false alarm, so Eva's thinking, I'm just going to sleep. Well, Esther rousted Eva out of bed, Ben woke up. Well, that's when Eva passed out. Eva noticed he had the same scared look that her mother displayed moments before. I don't have to ask you what happened, Esther told him. We need to get on the boat deck right away. Ben quickly donned pants over his pajamas and put on his shoes on the other foot. Even Eva was dressed. He wrapped her in a blanket and draped his heavy sheepskin lined coat over Esther's shoulders. Then he led them to the upper deck. On the way, they met a stewardess who told them, Everything is all right. It's just a drill. It's only a lifeboat drill. Don't be silly, Esther scoffed brushing her aside. They don't have lifeboat drills at midnight. The 
about your life, the trust lesson with activity. You know what lesson that is? If everybody's coming out there, there's all kinds of people running around. So bustle goes along with busy. The word had spread that the ship had struck an iceberg. Now fully awake, Eva was getting scared, especially when she saw her father off to the side hiding in the bottom of the ship. As the deck grew more, more crowded with passengers and crew, Eva heard someone yell, She can't stay afloat! Even then, the hearts hurried from one lifeboat station to another. There was not enough help. Only to be told they were already full. After failing to gain access in the first four boats, they tried. They found room in lifeboat 14. Ben handed Eva to a crewman, and then he held past her hand. Hold mommy's hand and be a good girl, Ben told Eva. When a teething twig was ordered out of the boat, Fifth Officer Howard Lowe pulled out his revolver and threatened to shoot him. A boy, a teenage boy, who threatened to shoot him. When other men surged forward, Stand back, Lowe ordered. I say, stand back. The next man who puts his foot in this boat, I will shoot. Shoot him down like a dog, he pointed the gun. Who was assisting other women and children into the boat. His foot was already in the boat. Don't shoot my daddy, Eva pleaded. Please don't shoot my daddy. Ben told Lo, I'm not going in, but for God's sake, look after my wife and child. Just moments later, the lifeboat, with Lo and three crewmen on board, was lowered. As it rode away from the stricken Titanic, most of the women and children were sobbing. Lo, who was standing at the stern, tried to quiet them. Don't cry, he urged. Please don't cry. I'll give you something else to do other than cry. Some can start bailing the water. Others can handle the oars, but please stop crying. Eva tried to stifle her sobbing, but she couldn't. She was terrified. She had been separated from her father. Help mommy bail, Esther told her. As they used the bailer to get the water out, Eva said, I keep kicking something under my feet. Esther reached down and felt around until she touched a cold, chilly person. My word, she yells, there's a poor wretch hiding under me. Esther, Eva, and several other women shifted positions as a slender, small man in a woman's coat emerged. So they wouldn't let me in all but he was dressed in a woman's coat, was hiding in the freezing water. So he's probably already has hypothermia. Apparently, the stowaway had sneaked into the boat before it was loaded and hid under the seat in about six inches of freezing water. He was so stiff he could barely move. Efforts to get him to talk failed because he didn't speak any English. He might be a coward, but he's a human being, said Esther. Let's try to keep him alive. So she and several women next to her rubbed his arms and legs to try to get his circulation good. So that, that will happen is that your, your blood almost like freezes. So they would rub him. And you know, when you rub, that friction helps warm things up. And so warming it up, it hopefully will get his blood flowing and that will help calm his body. Meanwhile, Eva was crying herself sick, vomiting several times. She wailed the loudest while watching the Titanic break apart and sink. When the water closed over the vessel, the once smooth surface heaved with the unlucky people who were destined to die. Many in their life vests begged for rescue. Others flailed helplessly among floating debris, including chairs, pillows, rugs, benches, tables, and food. The debris has to do with all of the stuff that's falling out. Lowe insisted on going back to pick up anyone still alive in the water. So remember, Lowe had the, pulled out his revolver and said he would shoot the next man that stepped in. But now he's trying to pull people out of the water. And a lot of the lifeboats were afraid to do that because it would unbalance. If they were pulling someone in who was struggling, that it would put the boat off of balance. And then they were afraid they might capsize. And uh, if they were in the water too long, that would give them hypothermia and they would die. 
To make room for the possible survivors, he had transferred many people from his lifeboat to others that were less crowded. A crewman picked up Eva and put her in the arms of a woman in another lifeboat on the starboard side. And someone, her mother, had gotten into a lifeboat on the port side. The little girl expected her mother to be with her, but in the confusion, they had been separated and they were in different lifeboats. So now, not only is Eva separated from her father, who she's watched go down in the Titanic, but now she and her mother are separated. And she's seven years old out on this huge, terrible night. And you just imagine, and I'm telling you that she lives with this for the rest of her life. And that, you know, that is, when you have a tragedy like this, sometimes you can never get it out of your head. Mummy, Eva shrieked. I want my mummy. I'm close by, baby, her mother hollered in the darkness. Be brave. Eva couldn't. She kept howling and vomiting until she quieted down from sheer exhaustion, much to the relief of the other passengers in the boat. When the sun finally peeked over the horizon, Eva thought she was dreaming because it looked as if her lifeboat was floating among an enormous fleet of yachts while glistening sails spread free. She then realized really sparkling icebergs moving slowly and majestically in the water that had turned choppy at daybreak. They had been calm the night before because they had hit the iceberg uh, that day before midnight and then it sunk around 2.20 in the morning. Maneuvering among the icebergs, the steamer, the Carpathia, began picking up the survivors, one lifeboat at a time. Eva was hauled up into, up in a Boat Swain's chair, and that kind of—I kind of wondered what that was, but it's kind of like a chair of some sort that they pull up with ropes, kind of like a swing, maybe. When she finally reached the deck of the rescue ship, the little girl searched among the hundreds of dazed, weeping women who were grieving over their lo their loved ones. She's looking for her parents. At least her mother, she knows, should be there. After what seemed like hours for Eva. It was really only minutes. She finally nestled into the comforting and tearful embrace of her mother. Where's daddy? Eva asked. The children back sobs. Mr. said, I don't know, baby. It might be a long time before we find out where he is. Esther couldn't bring herself to tell Eva that her father was not in the boat. Eva's friend Nina couldn't understand why her father, too, wasn't on board the Carpathia. When the Titanic began sinking, Reverend Harper had wrapped Nina in a blanket, kissed her goodbye, and handed her to a crewman who put her in lifeboat number 11 next to her Aunt Jessie. Now Reverend Harper was among the missing. I left Papa on the big boat and he told me to go with Aunt Jessie. Now I want Papa, he told Eva. Two days later, as the Carpathia steamed toward New York, Eva overheard her mother talking to several women who had lost their husbands. So that was the last I saw of my poor dear husband, Esther said in a quivering voice. No farewell kiss, no fond words. In a moment he was gone. I knew that I would never see my Ben again, and that I had lost the best and truest friend, the kindest and most thoughtful husband that a woman ever had. Esther started to cry. When she regained her composure, she talked about the emotional trauma Eva would face. What an experience for a little child to go through at the age of seven to have passed through the valley of death. I wonder if she will ever forget. I know I won't. When someone has gone through a tragedy like this, a lot of times they can't forget. And, it, and, it, and it's part of their life and it's very traumatic. And we have PSTD. Oh. PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. We give it a name now, but it, uh, it, it seems like that Eva and her mother will suffer that for the rest of their lives. Benjamin Hart's body was never found. Neither was Reverend John Harper's. After a short stay in New York, Eva and her mother returned to England, as did Nina and her aunt. Orphaned at the age of six, Nina was raised by relatives and later married a minister. She died at the age of 80 in 1996. Eva and her mother lived with Esther's parents near London until Esther remarried. 
throughout the rest of her childhood and into her 20s. Eva was plagued with nightmares stemming from the Titanic tragedy. She also feared any large body of water. I would wake up in a terrible panic and then I would rush into my mother's room and she would comfort me, Eva said in an interview in 1993. But when she died, I didn't have her around anymore. A few months after her mother's death, Eva, who was only 23, felt the only way to overcome these nightmares was to face them. So she booked herself on a ship going to Singapore. The first four days of sea, I wouldn't come out of my cabin. I kept telling the stewardess that I was seasick. She knew it wasn't true. I was too frightened. She made me get on deck, and then on, and from then on, I lost the terror. Although I don't like the sea, I had no more nightmares. But I still can remember the colors and the sounds, and everything seemed to be right. The worst thing. Later in life, Eva became an outspoken Titanic survivor. She repeatedly criticized the White Star Line for failing to provide enough lifeboats. She also condemned salvager, salvagers for insensitivity and greed when they began bringing up artifacts from the wreck in 1987. She said the site was the resting place of nearly 1,500 people, including her father, and should be left as a grave for those who never should have died. Just think how much it changed her life. And if her father had been allowed to get onto that lifeboat with her, she would have left him. They would have gone to Canada. And she still would have had the, the bad memories, but not as bad because she had her father. Eva, who never married, was a professional singer as well as a music teacher. During World War II, she entertained the troops and distributed emergency supplies in London after bombing raids a volunteer for numerous charities. She became a justice of the peace later in life. She died in 1996 at her home in London. And Eva Hart was named in her death. I hope you enjoyed hearing about Eva Hart and the young survivors of the Titanic. Thank you.